Pelt. I found the world's pelt nailed to the picture rail of a box room in a cheap hotel. So that's why rivers dry to scabs. That's why the grass weeps every dawn. That's why the wind feels raw. The earth's an open wound. And here, its skin hangs like a trophy, atrophy beyond all taxidermy, shrunk into a hearth rug. Who fleeced it? No record in the guest book, no one paid, just pocketed the blade and walked, leaving the bed untouched, TV pleasing itself. Maybe there was no knife, maybe the world shrugs off a hide each year to grow a fresh one. That pelt was thick as reindeer, so black it flashed with blue. I tried it on, of course, but no. <laughs> I'm read a couple of poems from um, uh, the last collection uh, called Dry Salter, and then I'm gonna read some from the collection that's coming out in, in August. Um, Dry Salter was a book of 150 poems of 15 lines each. It took its 150 measure from the Psalter, the Psalms, um, and some of its themes as well. Uh, the Psalms aren't 15 lines each, but I felt that if I was going to write that many poems, I needed some kind of formal principle to unify it. And uh, 15 lines is good because it's not quite a sonnet, so you keep having to not quite write sonnets. This is called Excise Me. So shattered is my heart from endless pounding at my chest wall to get out that I give in one summer dawn and cut, then lift it. Cupped in my hands like a half-caught bird, it cools and stills. I place it on the sill to keep it warm and lie down on my bed to take stock of this new thoracic calm. Hours pass. Then weeks, the sun through glass dries my heart into a peach stone. Another day, I think, just one more. To be sure, I will recall this stasis so deep, I can hear huge clouds of blind fish under ice sheets, spiders in the leaf mold of distant forests. Your thoughts. One of the most um, uncomfortable themes in the Psalms is the theme of the others, um, the people who aren't us, the outsiders, the enemies. Um, and as I got about two thirds of the way through this book, I thought I haven't written any poems responding to that in any way, and I, I felt I needed to. So this is one of a couple of attempts. It's called The Others. Other people wake up, wash, blink out at icy wastes or plumes of steam. Some are scared by what they have to do today. They dress in other people's many ways, shirt first, shirt last, no shirt at all, and some resent the clothes they have to wear. If you were there to see them, you would mark the way they thread their buttons through, the moo they give the mirror as they leave. Thoughts of other people are opaque. The weather in their souls, a mystery. Some from restive nights are slow to rise. Being other, they have not met you yet, but some with time and chance could love you if you would let them get that close. This next book of poems, um, which I'm going to read, it's not going to look like this, this is the proofs. But I've not really read from it yet, so um, this will be an interesting experiment to see if any of you doze off. Um, this is coming out in August, and it's coming out under the title Mancunia. So it seemed fitting to read a few of them here. It's in part about Manchester, but it's also uh, about uh, utopias and dystopias, the way that cities make myths about themselves. And um, my family's from Manchester, so we have plenty of family stories associated with Manchester as well. Um, but 
Some of this myth-making is contained in this one poem, and I don't normally hold poems up, and you can't quite see it right on this proof, but this is called Mancunian Diorama. Um, and it's intended to be read right across two pages. Um, I just hope in the real book they'll actually line it up properly. But, um, Manchester was famous in Victorian times for its diorama. There was a famous diorama uh, in Albert Square, which people used to come to, and the curtains would draw, be drawn back and you'd see a tableau of a, um, an alpine village or somewhere exotic. And um, so I thought, and in fact there are some great dioramas, natural history dioramas just down the road in the Manchester Museum. So I thought it fitting to do a diorama poem, encompassing some of the myths that attend to this city. Uh, it's all unpunctuated into one long sentence, so I might asphyxiate during it, but I'll, I'll do my best. A Mancunian diorama. The left edge of our vitrine is the downslope of a breast-shaped sandstone rise, and on its fall, a Roman fort, Mancunium, depicted by this fearsome wall and that spear-bearing boy. Note at his feet this predator with teeth around a Celtic neck, his wolf, not whippet, and beneath his smog, the brigand wears a pair of snakeskin boots bought from a boutique owned by that lad there, the world's first rock star footballer. Yes, they are all wax, above whose perfect hair hangs an experimental arrow Plane designed by a philosopher whose upturned eyes are met by that code cracker on his ladder, tending to the first computer, watching police women kissing at the pride parade. Now file along past mills and mills and mills, the ragged school kids spin bowling a clockwork orange being painted by the old boy in a mac and cap who draws in more dogs than there could have been. Now note the author of Condition of the Working Class in England being led through slums by his Irish lover, she who really showed him how the world was on the skew. And there his old pal sits in Chetham's library, distracted from his manifesto by our peppered moths evolved to live on blackened chimneys. Yes, this see-through box is graphene strong. So now you hear a snatch of song. That queue of people, far too long to be believable, is waiting for the world's most world-famous nightclub to open its doors. And halfway down the line you clock a noble suffragette, plotting to storm the Bastille, almost drowning out the shouts of Judas as a tambourine man plugs and plugs in up the road next door to Tootle Textiles, where, a personal aside, my parents met. Now eyes down and you catch the poor victims of Peterloo with cavalry long gone, attended by their loved ones overlooked by Dockland Cranes, the real ones seized by rust now, and rows of clerks at desks inscribing bills of lading, and now shh, you hear the simmer of a late soup dinner, stirred with his baton by the maestro still in tails, while beyond his kitchen flows the Irwell, and its banks are being walked by the novelist who marked out north and south for us, here strolling in a bid to take the air, but there is little left for her to take, just smoke made up of cotton fibres cut with silk, and snow-like spits of paper ever falling from the Arndale bomb, much to the terror of the animals at Bellevue, who form cross-species packs in order to survive, towards the right end of the case where our blizzard pixelate and all turns sandstorm is a believe, blank, unwritten. I can fix for you to come in here last thing when all the crowds have cleared, although the weight of it can be too much to bear. <sighs> The, um, the Mancunia book begins with um, a poem with a title I've been wanting to use for ages and was just trying to find the right reason to use it. Um, there's a kind of seabird, which you, you probably know, called Great Northern Diver, the Great Northern Diver. Absolutely nothing to do with Manchester, but it's always seemed connected to me, the Great Northern Diver. So the book begins with this. Mancunia at night looks like embers from above, but hold the dive, and it reassembles, cools, coalesces into districts, flyovers, a motherboard, now stadiums like unblinking eyes, car lots set out as piano keys, parks with lake wounds, counterflow of arteries in red and white. The base clef curves of cul-de-sacs in outlying estates, then factories with starting guns of smoke that sting and make you squint. Now you can pick out individual cars, 
nags heads down in dark fields, glow of dressed shop windows, drunks on their tightrope walk home. Black poplars, ragged tops, roof tiles, curbstones, air that drops from ice to cloud to everything a city cooks at once until the road meets you face to face, down and under, slower, denser, and the clay arrests you, holds you as a pulse for good. So what keeps this city alive is you. This is um, a poem called On Your Birthday, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a response to, uh, it's a birthday poem for a friend with whom I was having a, uh, a discussion about, um, I don't know how we got onto it, about the afterlife. The possibility of an afterlife. On your birthday, I give you the northern quarter in full vamp. Its post-drizzle glory, sun and arc lamp on that mural of a blue tit, vast and antic, with bindweed blooms like blast holes in old brick. Spiralling above this massive passerine, painted candles rise towards some heaven. I thought how you would hate that twist, since you dismiss the promise of all worlds but this. How you would sooner have your cold cadaver thrown into a skip than warrant any hope of a hereafter. The street cleaners are out in force. Steam from northern tea power frosts its glass. Vintage frock stores shake their racks for moths. The last payphone on Newton Street rings out. And picking through the gutter at your feet, a blackbird holds the same trill on repeat. This is no epiphany, but so close up, such is the soft density of darkness on its nap, that like an inverse star it could pull everyone, the whole unrescued world through to oblivion. If there is another place, another chapter, I suggest this Ancoat Skylark is its harbinger. But then you pick it up and show how light it is, its air sacs, and its fluted bones, it flies. I was uh, commissioned in the course of writing this, well actually it was quite a while ago before I was writing this book, but it, I returned to it after I was uh, working on this book, to write um, a poem for the verb, the Radio 3 uh, program, when they moved from the centre of Manchester to their new home in Media City, in Salford. Um, and I thought, I have a kind of personal memory of uh, where Media City now is, in that my, uh, my grandfather, who worked there, worked um, on, on the docks, took me there when I was about seven. And I remember being taken around and looking at the cranes and the ships and being told what used to be unloaded there. And then, um, of course, now it's, it's Gotham. It's the full high-tech city. Um, but I thought what it, what it lacks is a myth that might connect those two parts of its history. So um, I created this, this myth. It's a poem called Miss Molasses. And it's, if any of you know Elizabeth Bishop's famous poem, The Man Moth, uh, which begins with a misprint she saw of her mammoth, the man moth, and then she conjures beautifully this this chimeric creature, the man moth, in her poem. So I've, I've, I've used the, the form, the structure, and some of the opening lines for the stanzas from Elizabeth Bishop's by the man moth. This is Miss Molasses. Here, above, on the wind-cut roofs of key house, dock house, bridge house, you can keep a night-long vigil, lie in wait for her, tease out her subtle call from the sob songs and bulletins sirens of the city. Good luck with it. She has a startle reflex so acute, the slightest hint of you, a cough, smell of mint, the moon caught on a watch face, and she's gone, down the glass-faced towers, back into the ship canal. A ripple the size of a cap in the still waters under the swing bridge. But when this salt lass surfaces, fugitive and rare, 
in daylight, at the earliest of doors, before the trams spark up, before the breakfast show begins, she moves between dimensions, a traceuse over steel and concrete, a pulse of light along the fiber optic cables, a data burst between, above, within, and through the runnels, like a sliver, like an elver, like a half-digital, half-analog orphan of the old docks, evolved to live and hunt and thrive in this Gotham of the North. Up the facades, she feels for the gaps and seams in these towers, slides in with a shimmy and a flick, and starts her search. On empty desks, in stacks of paper, backs of sofas. This quest is not born of spirit, nor of mind. She has no picture in her head of what she's looking for. Instead, it rises from her bones, as close to her as thirst, as hunger, drives her up and out from the silted bed of this sulfured basin, an endless longing for the one thing she's lost. Then she returns empty-handed, empty-hearted, to the solace of unwitnessed waters. And if you ever wondered where she came from, our best guess is some mesh of sun, brine, and cargo spill at the mouth of the Mersey, where it lips the Irish Sea. An accidental alchemy of salmon smolt and roach, tobacco, sisal, mangrove bark, cotton seeds, and copper. This all conjured her, our shy chimera, and she tracked the great ships inland through such foul water that one fag end could ignite it all. Each night she must rehearse all these, the details of her origins, to try to work out what she's missing, how she grew lithe and strong beneath the rusted holes, the shadow of the dockside cranes, how she fed on coffee, butter, beeswax from the holes and warehouses, how a docker saw her slipping out one night dripping with cane syrup, took it for a brunette sweep of hair and called her Miss Molasses, gave birth to the myth of the sulphured mermaid and her song. If you catch her, run a flashlight over her scales, see the cross hatch of scratches and wounds from her desperate climbs and leaps. What does she want from us? Take a microphone and hold it to her lips. Turn up the game to try to catch a word on the end of her tongue, a line or a list or an old lament for the salt she left behind, in a voice as rich and sweet as sorghum, maple, blackstrap, barley malt. She wants to bear witness, but she needs all your attention. And I'll finish with a short poem, which again was from Dry uh, And this is a a poem called The Vows. The Vows. We pledge to wake each morning face to face, to shun the orders of the busy sun. We promise to disturb each other's peace. And we will, yes, gaze at the pining moon. We'll pick out brine blown glass gems from the strand. We'll read our future scratched onto a stone. We both believe that silence turns to sand and promise not to add to the unsaid. We meet here as the raging sea meets land. We want the risen life before we're dead. Our passion will be squandered more than spent. We hereby swear to spend our days in bed. We're naked till we wear each other's scent and recognize it quicker than our own. You start and finish me. You're my extent. <laughs>